everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for this kind invitation. It's a nice place and a nice conference. I really enjoy it. I also enjoy the food, so I think I enjoy everything here. Uh, don't pay attention to the date. It was written during the magical day of Sinterklaas, as everybody knows now. Uh, but uh, the, it, it, it came to, to be presented today. So I will talk about an old idea that was developed nearly one century ago by uh, Louis de Broglie. Um, and that's called the Double Solution Program. Um, here is the content of the talk. First, I will also recall the concept of Poincaré pressure uh, that was introduced in 1906, uh, the idea of the Bruce, uh, Double Solution of 1927. Um, and I'll make a connection uh, between these ideas and um, solid cl classical gravity, in particular the Schrodinger Newton equation. And <coughs> after this, I will. Uh, try to apply uh, these concepts, um, making use of an ansatz that I call the factorization ansatz, uh, to describe in the first time quantum objects or quantum elementary particles, and that's a very speculative part. And I also use uh, these, uh, these tools to uh, describe uh, Walker's phenomenology. So Walker's are also called bouncing oil droplets. These are uh, droplets of oil that are uh, dropped on a vibrating surface of oil. And because of the vibration, they will not uh, spread. They will uh, remain uh, in the form of droplets during a long time, and they will diffuse at the surface. And it was noticed that uh, their trajectories, if you average their trajectories, which is uh, there's a Brownian uh, component, but if you average over all these uh, Brownian realizations, you find something that is some quantum-like properties. And actually, these uh, tools uh, uh, are interesting for uh, uh, characterizing the phenomenology of this game. So I will, I will end with this. Um, <coughs> Poincaré, um, in 1906, um, was working on a model for the electron, where the, the, the electron was not a point, but it had some structure. It was some density of charge. And already at that time, he faces the problem that uh, the electron has a tendency to spread. And in order to, to preserve the uh, corpuscular nature of the electron, he introduced uh, a pressure, negative pressure, so called Poincare pressure, um, <coughs> aimed at preventing the spread of the electron. And you can find a bit the same idea in a letter of uh, Lawrence who in a letter of Einstein to Lorentz in 1909, here he was not talking about the electron, but the photon. And um, <clears throat> the problem was that Einstein was aware that it was necessary to give a corpuscular description of light at that time. Uh, but at the same time, if you take Maxwell equation, uh, waves have a natural tendency to spread. And so that's a real problem. Or can you explain that a photon uh, will not spread and, and will remain uh, individual particles. And he wrote to Lawrence, uh, the essential thing, the essential thing seems to me not uh, to be not the assumption of singular points. He was discussing about uh, a possibility to destroy photon by singular point, but that's another story. But the assumption of field equations of a kind that permit solutions in which finite quantities of energy propagate with velocity c in a specific direction without dispersion. So, uh, he had the idea that maybe one could replace Maxwell field equation by nonlinear equation. And this is an idea that will uh, come back also uh, later um, in the framework of quantum mechanics, where we have, uh, again, the same problem that um, if we describe a particle by a wave, the wave has a tendency to spread. And it's difficult to explain why particles remain particles, uh, why they remain sharply localized. There is a formal solution to the problem, and I think the majority of physicists now has adopted this interpretation, which is the probabilistic interpretation. But there are other possibilities. And for instance, De Bruyne never believed in the, in the probabilistic interpretation. Uh, he believed that um, <coughs> the world was realist and uh, that uh, the, the content of the uh, Schrodinger wave function uh, was, was not related to, to the probabilistic interpretation. Actually, uh, De Broglie believed that there were um, <coughs> two waves necessary to describe what we call a corpus. Um, um, there was the Schrodinger wave, and uh, there was 
also a, a peak uh, wave, a singularity, or depending it evolves with the time, sometimes it was a, uh, an infinite singularity, or sometimes it was simply a hump, uh, what we call no solitons, for which the dispersion, by definition, gets compensated by the nonlinearity. And this is what is called the double solution problem. So, in the Breuss view, um, there is only one object, which is the wave. The particles are just a special type of wave. So there is no wave-particle duality. There is wave, wave monies. But there are two types of waves. There is the pilot wave, which is not the, the, the final description that you can give of the reality of the, of the particle. But there is also the peak solid, soliton, which remains localized due to some linearity or eventuality due to some singularity. And, <clears throat> and this is what I will uh, develop now, this idea of, uh, of the Bryce double solution. In particular, we'll focus on this uh, peak solitonic uh, solution. Um, if you look at the literature, from time to time, there were proposals to generalize Schrodinger equation and uh, to generalize it and to replace it by uh, a nonlinear equation. So to add some nonlinearity, some nonlinearity in the Schrodinger equation. This was done, for instance, by the Alimiti Birula. There is a model of the 60s of Bombup where they described the, uh, the measurement process also with a nonlinear uh, equation. There were proposals by Weinberg. Uh, there are several uh, members of the De Breuil School, for instance, Farg in France, who also worked on that program. And so from time to time in the literature, there are new proposals, new discussions. And more recently, there, were, uh, there was a, a lot of work around the Schrodinger equation. And I will, from now, focus on this, on this equation. It's a good example. For me, it's a good candidate to, to realize uh, the price double solution problem. Um, so about the Schrodinger-Newton equation, um, it is what is called a semi-classical equation. So it belongs to the program of uh, semi-classical uh, Gravity, and you can find uh, pioneer ideas in the 60s, for instance, according to Moller and Rosenfeld. It was not necessary to quantize space time. Space time was supposed to be classical. It's only matter that is quantum in this view. And if you develop this idea, you can derive in the non relativistic limit this equation, the Newton Schrodinger equation, um, where uh, the, the particle would uh, undergo a self-gravitational interaction. So you see here that the source term, oh, sorry, uh, the, the source term is this, this uh, density, um, which is related to, to the wave function itself. So this is a nonlinear equation. It is also non-local. Uh, it is complicated uh, to study. There is no exact solution uh, for this equation. But there are some results. For instance, there, there are results of Lieb who showed the existence of a unique ground state for this equation. Uh, actually, um, when Lieb studied it, it was related to the context of astrophysics, where you can also derive an equation that, is, uh, uh, that looks like the static version of the schrodinger newton equation. And so in that case, it is called the, the Schocker equation. Um, and so he showed the existence of, uh, of a unique ground state, and uh, numerical studies established that uh, if you fix delta norm to be one, delta norm of this ground state, then you find that the size of this ground state is of the order of the combination of this local constant, this upper equation. And so uh, one can consider that this ground state is a self collapse uh, state, which is spontaneously localized. And this will correspond to the concept of soliton. Uh, the framework of the double solution program. And it is interesting uh, that with this simple model, you can already say things about the classical quantum transition. For instance, you see that uh, the radius of uh, this ground state goes to zero uh, when the mass becomes large. So this will correspond to the classical limit in which the soliton will, will correspond to uh, a material point. On the contrary, if you go to the quantum limit, when you consider an electron or an atom or things like that, um, the, the Lieb radius is very large. It goes to infinity when the mass goes to, goes to zero. <coughs> and in this case, actually, cell gravity doesn't play a role. It's too weak to influence the behavior of the object. 
And you can still consider in that limit that the object is a delocalized object as it is like that. And uh, if you look at what happens in between these two, these two uh, extreme uh, regimes, uh, you see that the, there appears uh, naturally a quantum classical transition, and, and this was pointed out by Diozzi in 94. Um, <clears throat> and you can, you can see that very easily if you consider, for instance, <coughs> a sphere of homogeneous density in that you vary the radius of the sphere. Uh, in between these two extreme behaviors, uh, you will see that the mesoscopic transition correspond to the situation where the Lieb radius um, is exactly equal to the radius of the sphere. So in that case, you expect that um, the nonlinearity non will uh, begin to become important. And it's very easy to, to develop this equation because the mass is related to density. And if you take normal density here, uh, you find that in two minutes that the radius corresponding to this uh, mesoscopic uh, sphere is of the order of 100 nanometers. So this fixes uh, a transition where the, the quantum to classical, uh, where one should pass from the quantum to the classical regime. Um, now there are many problems with uh, this equation. There are um, conceptual problems, no theorems that I will describe later, but uh, there is also a problem is that uh, up to now, this is still uh, fully speculative because it was not possible to confirm, to confirm the existence of this self-gravitational interaction or, or to falsify it. Uh, because self-gravity is very weak and uh, it's very difficult actually to, to, to measure uh, manifestations of self-gravity. Um, and for instance, what one can do, um, I, I will pass this a bit quickly, but uh, you can find the reference here. Um, <clears throat> it is, it, it is uh, easily masked by decoherence, by uh, environmental decoherence. One can uh, define uh, critical parameters depending on the mass of the object. And um, <clears throat> if the decoherence parameter, which is uh, the product of the, the rate of collision with object of the environment, divided by the square of the, the wavelength of this object, so this can be photons or atoms, on. If the rate, if the uh, decoherence parameter is larger than this critical parameter, then decoherence dominates self gravity, and it's not possible to make a conclusive experiment because you will not see the manifestation of uh, self gravity. And so, up to now, there was no conclusive experiment. And it doesn't seem to be easy to do. It's not impossible, but it's not easy. Um, there is also the problem that if you begin to work with uh, nanospheres of uh, radius uh, 100 nanometers, uh, the decoherence be begins really to be strong and you, you will also lose the quantum coherence. It's very difficult to preserve uh, the object from decoherence. You, you must uh, cool everything. You must uh, realize a nearly perfect vector and so on. Um, <clears throat> and that's not easy. And so there is this problem of Van der Waals interaction that was mentioned. If you want to manipulate the object, um, you must trap it. Because if you want to, to displace it with uh, mechanical devices by, by, uh, by hanging, hanging it to, so, to something, um, you will have problem with Van der Waals interaction, which is quite stronger than the, the self gravitation So you must work with, uh, with traps, and uh, that's not so easy to do. And <clears throat> also, there is a uh, there's another reason why it's difficult to, to make this experiment is that um, if you take these traps, uh, you will confine uh, the center of mass of the nanosphere in a very small region, but there it will have a lot of kinetic energy, consequence of Heisenberg uncertainties. And um, one can show that if there is too much kinetic energy, uh, it will dominate self gravity. So because of all these problems, it was not possible yet to, to put into evidence the existence or not existence of no, um, there are also other open problems which are, which are more conceptual. And there are two no-go theorems related to, to, to the boy approach. Uh, one of them is the Derrick no-go theorem that was formulated in the 60s. And it concerns the stability of uh, the ground state of uh, such nonlinear equation. And another theorem is the Gizan no-go theorem formulated in the 90s. Uh, which uh, shows that there, there is a link between nonlinearity and locality, in the sense that if you allow 
uh, nonlinear uh, evolution equations, for example, this kind, then in principle, uh, you could realize a supraluminal uh, telegram, which is, of course, uh, a bit difficult. Um, <coughs> Derek Nogo theorem, I will not give all the details, it concerns a very large class of nonlinear Schrodinger equations, among which uh, the Schrodinger Newton equation. And um, <coughs> According to this theorem, it is possible by rescaling, if you have a ground state for a given uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, it's possible to rescale this solution, this solution to generate states with, with energy lower than the energy of the ground state that you consider. So it is no more ground state. Uh, now there is a fly in the argument is, 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 that, you, is that if you look at uh, what happens when you rescale the state, um, actually, at the same time, you decrease the energy, but you increase the L2 norm. And this is forbidden in the quantum context because um, the Schrodinger Newton equation, for instance, pre preserves the norm of, of uh, the state during the evolution. And so this is in contradiction with uh, the constraint imposed by the evolution. So this, this no go theorem is, is actually more of a scarecrow than something else. But um, it dissuaded dissuade that many people to work on that, uh, on that topic in the, in the 70s, and uh, um, actually it is not really true. Now, more serious is the Giza Nogo theorem. Uh, <clears throat> roughly summarize the idea is the following. You consider uh, an EPR bell state with two subsystems A and B, and imagine that uh, at the side of uh, the B, for instance, um, so at the side, sorry, at the side of A, uh, you make measurements, and by doing so, you realize, uh, you, you can obtain different realization of the same density matrix uh, at the level of the system B. Because of no signaling, the reduced density of matrix of B does not depend on what you do in A, but nevertheless, you can realize it in different ways, depending on the choice of A. And then, um, what Giza noticed is that if A uh, can man manipulate and control the nonlinearity uh, of the side, he can differentiate different realization of the density matrix, which is not possible uh, with the linear Schrodinger. And so by doing so, it will be informed of the choice that was performed by uh, the other side. And so uh, by doing so, it's possible to send information faster than lag, and that's a serious problem. Um, <clears throat> now, as Giza noted himself, uh, there are uh, different ways to circumvent, uh, to circumvent this uh, Nogo theorem. And uh, a way to restore causality and no signaling is to add stochasticity to the nonlinearity uh, in an ad hoc manner uh, in order that Bond's rule is satisfied. Because it is Bond's rule finally that, that guarantees that uh, uh, signaling is, is impossible. And there are examples in the literature uh, of nonlinear generalization. Some equation uh, with some stochastic noise that will give you at the end the bond rule, and then there is no problem. Uh, for instance, there is the, the bond of theory of statistics. Uh, you can also consider that all the spontaneous localization models belong to, to this class. Um, <coughs> Uh, the Breubohm uh, dynamics at Telegrium, so when the, the time of the square uh, distribution is, is obeyed, uh, is also uh, a theory that prohibits uh, faster than light signaling. And also the standard Copenhagen interpretation with collapse uh, belongs to this category. So many models uh, that are currently used uh, belong to this category. So you have the combination of non-locality and stochasticity in such a way that, in average, uh, causality is, is still good. Um, <clears throat> now we have a problem with the uh, Newton-Schrodinger equation, is that uh, it is deterministic. And so um, this justifies, for me, uh, an interesting question, a challenge, which is to try to, to derive the bond rule from the Schrodinger equation. Um, I have no definitive answer to this problem. It is still largely open, but I think it's not impossible to, to realize that program. Uh, if you look, for instance, to chaotic systems, it is known that some deterministic, deterministic systems um, practically behave stochastically. So there is a natural indeterminism related to, related to their behavior because they are chaotic. Um, and 
There are several works by the people who are listed here and still others, I didn't put all the names, uh, that also try to show that the De Bruybaum dynamics belongs to this category, so that the bond rule emerges naturally from the uh, Bohmian dynamics. And so uh, one way to save the Schrodinger-Newton equation regarding uh, the no signaling theorem of the no-go theorem of Lida, um, <coughs> would be <laughs> to derive the, um, uh, the Breubohm dynamics from the uh, Schrodinger-Newton uh, equation. So this is what, what I will describe uh, in the next slide. Another possibility that I will also consider later is to add stochastic noise to the evolution in, in order finally to ensure quantum equilibrium in the bond. Um, <clears throat> now I come to more recent re results that I derived uh, last year. Um, so um, <clears throat> I introduced to, to, to deal with the Schrodinger-Newton equation, um, in particular in the presence of uh, an external potential, I introduced uh, what I call the factorization ansatz which is that I try a solution of this nonlinear equation in the form of the product of uh, something that will behave in first approximation like the pilot wave. This will be a solution of the linear Schrodinger equation with the linear potential of this sphere. And uh, a soliton uh, that will get self-focused by the, the nonlinearity of the <coughs> And so, in first approximation, psi L is solution of the usual Schrodinger equation. Um, there is an important ingredient also in my approach is that I do not require that the L2 norm of psi is equal to one. In particular, I do not require that the soliton uh, is normalized to, to unit. And that's a bit new compared to what people usually do. Um, <coughs> and so, um, what I did, and you can find all this in the rest here, is that um, I consider what, what will happen if there are two solitons, A and B, and um, <coughs> I represent the, so the two particles A and B by solitons, and I force them to follow uh, the De Bruyne dynamics. Actually, I could have imposed other conditions, but that's not important. What is important is that they are localized. And um, actually, if you look at, at the equation of the previous page, um, in this Laplacian, uh, if you apply this to this product, you will get interaction. The, Lapla the Laplacian will give you Laplacian working on the linear wave times the other one, plus Laplacian working on the soliton times the linear wave, plus the product of the gradient. Is the product of the gradient. And this induces an interaction between the soliton and uh, the linear wave. And so uh, I looked at this interaction when there are two objects, and uh, I found that uh, in good approximation, I can describe uh, the influence, the feedback of the solitons on the linear wave uh, by this expression. And so I would have source terms in uh, the Schrodinger equation that correspond to the presence of a particle in A equal A and particle in equal B. And in this, when I do this derivation, actually I must assume that uh, the, the ground state is some particular property. So it is like a Gaussian state uh, where the soliton is located and the tails uh, decay exponentially. And if I do that, I arrive to this condition here, to good approximation. And, um, and then to solve this equation, I also um, looked for a solution of this, this, sorry, of this disturbed linear equation uh, where I would have um, a solution of the idiomogeneous equation which factorizes like a product of a solution of the homogeneous equation with some field here. And if I do that, uh, actually by, there are some terms that will be small provided the velocity of the solitons are small and things like that. I do some approximations. And I find something which looks like the Poisson equation. And so uh, what is interesting here is that the Laplacian that you see there is coming from the Schrodinger equation. It's not imposed from outside what is usually done uh, in the Schrodinger-Newton uh, Newton equation. So in this case, um, I have a pseudo or an effective gravitational interaction that comes from the feedback on the soliton on the linear wave. 
And uh, so I found something that looks like uh, the Newton potential. Um, <coughs> and, and so to conclude this, I find that there is a, an effective gravitational interaction with, uh, in the short term, so something proportional to the size of the, of the solid. And if I impose that uh, this will coincide with the Newton gravity, this fixes actually conditions on the size of the soliton, and I find that the size of, of the soliton is related to the field of height and the Newton constant by this, uh, which is actually the Schwarzschild uh, radius of the particle. So this approach, one would consider that the solitons represent many black holes. Um, <clears throat> this, this length actually is very small. For instance, for the electron, it's, it's even beyond the, the Planck scale, uh, and it's quite smaller than the Lib radius. Uh, if you will uh, compute the Lib radius for the electron, you will find that something that's huge. Uh, and, and so this makes the difference with the usual approach, and that's related to the fact that I did not decide to impose that the L2 norm of, of psi is one, and uh, this gives me the freedom to rescale to ground state and uh, by rescaling, uh, as it must, uh, I can uh, I can fulfill this condition. Um, <clears throat> there is also a very large relation that can be derived for the Schrodinger equation. So if I uh, look at the energy of the ground state and so on, uh, I find something that is that is huge also. And this is different from the usual approaches where. The nonlinearity is considered as a perturbation. Here it is, it is, uh, it is the, the, the linear, uh, I mean, the, the linear potential and so on are, are a very small regard in comparison to the, the linearity. So there is a huge nonlinearity here that, uh, that will stabilize the solid time. And so uh, this makes also the difference where approaches where people try to monitor or to, to observe uh, a self collapse uh, to the ground state because in this case we may suppose that the particles have self collapsed since the beginning. So they will correspond actually to, to the material points in the moment of the push. Uh, the particles collapse uh, a long time ago and then it behaves for the rest of time of the particles. There is no spontaneous collapse that will appear. It appeared already in the past uh, long time ago. Um, <coughs> Now, there is another challenge is that uh, I would like to, to connect also the Schrodinger Newton equation with the de Broglie Bohm dynamics. And then uh, the question is is it possible from this factorization and that to, uh, to derive uh, the Bohmian dynamics that will correspond to uh, the velocity which is given here? So uh, the soliton would, uh, so the velocity that is given by this expression. Would of the definition of the de Broglie dynamics. Um, actually, if I, if I compute, if I make some approximation, I must assume that the soliton is peaked and then I do some approximation. I find that um, the, the velocity of the soliton, which I call the B velocity, is uh, the sum of this de Broglie uh, velocity plus something else, contribution coming from the internal degrees of freedom of the soliton. And uh, so this is not the de Broglie bohm dynamic because there is this correction here. And uh, recently, I did some numerical simulations, and uh, it shows that uh, this velocity may not be neglected. Uh, so there is a problem here, because uh, what we find is not exactly the problem. So uh, to conclude this part, um, <clears throat> in order to fulfill my program, which was to mimic the, the Bohmian dynamics with these solitons, I must uh, conjecture that there is some mechanism that I don't know uh, that will uh, kill the contribution from the internal degrees of freedom of the soliton. So I could invoke some uh, stochastic noise such so that averaging on this noise that will kill the internal the contribution. In that case, I will find the problem. So this is an open question. Uh, in the past, Bohm, Vigier, and the Breuil worked on this possibility that uh, beside the quantum potential, there will be some, uh, also some stochastic uh, Brownian motion superposed to the, the Bohm trajectories, and that's an open question. 
Um, it could be related to the turbo regum, and I'm not trying to study uh, the nonlinear Dirac equation. This is something that could play that role, but this is largely, still largely uh, an open question. So that was for the uh, description of particles in terms of these uh, of these solitons and of these uh, factorization ansatz. So this is where I come, and there's still a long way to go. Um, I had some more uh, success uh, um, for what concerned the, the droplets. So I apply my, my model to these droplets. Um, <clears throat> and so as I said at the beginning, um, these bouncing all droplets or walkers uh, are objects that uh, possess some quantum-like properties. And for instance, if you, so they are vibrating on the surface of, of, of the vessel with oil. If you put uh, two, uh, two, two slits, um, you will see that the trajectory when the particle passes through one slit is still influenced by the, the presence of the other slit. And so in this sense, uh, the object exhibits some, some wallness and it, it is reminiscent of the pilot wave theory of, uh, of, the, of the Breuer bomb. And um, <coughs> If you look at the paper uh, about the properties of these objects, uh, it has also been observed that the uh, two walkers will interact with a pseudo-gravitational interaction. Uh, for instance, in this paper, you can read that um, we find, depending on the value of V, so V is the distance between two walkers, the interaction is either repulsive or attractive. So um, <clears throat> there is an attraction, which in some cases is attractive and looks like, like gravitation. Uh, when repulsive, the, the drop follows two approximately hyperbolic trajectories. When attractive, this is usually a mutual capture of the two walkers into orbital motion similar to, to that of twin stars. So there is some effective pseudo-gravitational interaction between these walkers. And um, I also repeated the previous analysis uh, for the walkers. So uh, I also introduced uh, um, a, linear, a linear wave that will represent actually uh, the vessel which is created by the walkers and represent the interaction with the environment. So the, the walkers, they speak to the environment via this, uh, this wave. And then I have the two walkers. Um, in this case, I'm not in a, in a non-relativistic context anymore because if you look at the velocities, the velocity of what will be the velocity of light for, for the droplets is the velocity, is the sound velocity and propagation of the sonic waves at the surface of the vessel. And this is small, but it's not so high, and the velocities of the, of the droplets are not small regarding to, to the speed of sound. And so I must take account of these relativistic corrections. So now I write D'Alembert equation to describe the process. Um, actually, this is wrong. The, this should be uh, the pseudo gravitational potential to introduce the force. And in this case, um, I can also introduce uh, FO to represent the forcing frequency of the vessel. And so there is a natural wavelength that emerges out of this, which is the ratio between the velocity of sound and the frequency of force. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, I must, if I consider this pseudo gravitational interaction, I must solve uh, the, the D'Alembert equation with the two source terms as before. And, um, I do that, I write the equation. Um, and now the trick is to see that uh, due to forcing, um, I can replace this, uh, this, term, this term derivative here by something proportional to the frequency of the forcing. And uh, this is what people also do in optics when they work in the harmonic regime. They begin with the Lambert equation. And if you look at uh, some waves that have a well-defined frequency, you have this equation, which is a Helmholtz equation. And for this equation, the green function is not in one on, uh, one on R, but it is cos cosinus KR, KR on R, uh, which means that instead of having a purely attractive uh, interaction between the droplets, I have um, sev several zones of uh, attraction, repulsion, attraction, repulsion, and so on. And this is in agreement with experimental observation because uh, with Thor and Kuder, we did all these experiments we noted the quantization of the orbits for the twin stars. And later I discussed with uh, Thor who confirmed, confirmed me that between two 
quanta zombies, there is repulsion actually. This is why uh, uh, the, parti the particle doesn't stay there. It will move to an orbit where there is attraction and where it is there. So um, this is the agreement with the experimental uh, observation. Okay, so to conclude, um, I studied so this uh, uh, <coughs> generalization of uh, the Schrodinger equation, in particular, uh, the state gravitation of Schrodinger equation, the Newton Schrodinger. And I tried to uh, realize the double the double solution program, in particular, I applied the factorization ansatz, in which I write the solution as the product of the pilot wave and particle soliton. Um, <clears throat> in the case of the quantum system, I find that the feedback of the pilot wave results in gravitation. Um, I also uh, notice that if I want to realize the Boyce program and to derive the Boyce bohr trajectories, uh, I must involve the existence of a stochastic disturbance. Uh, otherwise, uh, I will have departure from the Boyce dynamic. Um, in the case of uh, uh, droplets, uh, actually I didn't say that, but when the droplet is vibrating on the surface, there are waves that are created by, by its presence, and when it falls, it will sometimes be pushed on the left or on the right, and so there is an intrinsic um, Robian uh, motion that you have for the droplet. So I think that the model that I developed before is better for the droplets. For, for uh, the boy program, there are still uh, many problems to solve. Uh, but at least for the droplets, um, I think there is good agreement with uh, what has been observed. And so this kind of model could explain uh, also the connection, the apparent connection between uh, the droplets' behavior and quantum physics. Of course, I don't believe that droplets are quantum objects. It may be that this nonlinear dynamics is something in between quantum physics and, and this uh, hydrodynamics. And, and that's it. Um, you mean a fundamental picture of quantum physics. I'm curious what this uh, stochastic, what was the source of your st stochastic disturbance? Do you have a, well, is there a fundamental way of thinking of it? No, is it I say this is an open problem for me. Uh, it's a problem to solve. I looked a bit at the, gener uh, the relativistic generalization of the Schrodinger-Newton equation, so, so some nonlinear Dirac equation. And th there are some properties that are common to Schrodinger Newton and Dirac Newton when I impose this, fact this uh, factorization ansatz. And I must do also some approximations and so on. And I think that uh, maybe the explanation of this uh, stochasticity uh, will be Zitterbewegung. But that's something I must still. Uh, I must still uh, this is just a first impression. I still work on it. So it could be of, of relativistic origin. If it works, because maybe it will not. This is new. Since I, I've heard a number of people talk about these walkers and using them as a model for what might really be going on in quantum mechanics, I've been curious about what happens when you get to the multi-particle case and entanglement. So in, there is no entanglement. Well, for the real walkers, obviously not. But but in the case of the ah. double solution, okay, does it occur in real this. space or in configuration space? No, okay, that's a good question. I didn't show that because I had no time. So for the walkers, I did everything in three-dimensional real space. And I have uh, the, the linear wave in x, y, z times uh, the, the soliton in x, y, z. And it's just when I have two solitons, is that they see the same environment and everything is in three dimensions in the real space. That's classical. But all this, if you go to the paper, it's only a sketch because your physics status is very small. So I, I developed a bit uh, the, the equation, but just to give an idea. Uh, I can, for instance, introduce entangled uh, particles. And so um, the idea is that uh, you write the linear wave as we will do. And then if I have, if I have uh, uh, undiscernible particles, I write a product of solitons for all of them. Uh, now, if I have identical particles, uh, I write the linear fermionic or bosonic wave, and then I write a product of solitons that, that I can uh, uh, 
but I see that's why. So there are always bosons in there. So this respect the boson curve from nature. And I can derive the same uh, property. So it's a bit different, but I compute the same property. So this can be done. My real problem is that uh, I don't find the, the boy bond dynamics, which is what I wanted. No, uh, I tried that and I see what it gives. It's not really an android. I tried this. Ah. No, no, no. No, actually, yeah. Uh, it's a bit messy and it's not, there are things that I neglect. And actually, I impose these ansatz and then I have something complicated with uh, the, linear, uh, the linear wave, the, the polyton. Uh, I split it in two, and this can be done a bit arbitrarily. For instance, in the first time, uh, I imposed that the, the pilot wave was exact solution of the linear wave, and then the interaction I put to see what happens to the soliton. This is how I derived this expression with the real velocity. Yeah. But there's something else that I can do, is that I impose that the soliton follows the De Broglie bond trajectory, and then there is a part of the interaction that I put back in the, at the level of the pilot wave, and there I find this pseudo-gravitational interaction. But there is no exact solution, but even for the Schrodinger-Newton equation, there is no exact solution. So all what I can do is to, to try to get some physical insight and do these things and make an approximation and see the effect and try to understand the physics of the problem. But there is nothing exact in that. Okay, um, well, if there are no further questions, we probably have time for coffee. Let's thanks Thomas again. Thank you.